Hi, I'm Ken Korn with the Veterans History Museum of the Carolinas, and I'm here with Curator. My name is Tom Bugala. I'm uh, one of the curators here at the Veterans History Museum of the Carolinas. And we know everybody's probably sitting at home looking around on the internet, you know, getting their history fix off the internet because they can't visit uh, museums right now. So that's why we decided we wanted to do some of these virtual tours, if you would, if you will. Um, so we've been talking about uh, Tom's family and uh, his experiences and with his uh, uncle being in in. I don't know where I'm going with this. I really don't. But anyway, <laughs> it's a good thing we can edit, that's for sure. <laughs> right. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about my experiences that I had in Iraq. So I was what's called a embedded photojournalist. And what that means was I was working for a TV station in Raleigh, North Carolina at the time, and Fort Bragg. Uh, General Swanick, the commanding officer of Fort Bragg, decided that he wanted to come up to our TV station and offer us uh, embeds, which basically meant that journalists went with whatever army unit they were assigned to. They went with whatever unit, and they basically went into Iraq exactly the way they did, and they pretty much lived and breathed, you know, just like the regular just like the army. I mean, I, I literally joined the army for a month. You, you had month. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you had to do what they did. There yeah, absolutely. No I mean, there was right? yeah, no special privileges. We yeah. slept on cots. We slept in tents. Uh, you know, we had, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to take my showers with baby wipes and everything else. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences over there. And uh, one of the stories that really stuck out to me was uh, when I found a medal on the ground called the Mother of All Battles Medal. <laughs> so basically what was happening is we were uh, convoying. Uh, we started out in Kuwait, and I got up with the 37th <clears throat> Engineering Battalion. When did you get Fred. there, Ken? What, oh, well, I guess... Timeline. You know, so, yes. So I got there in March of 2003. So it was okay. right before... We landed in Kuwait three days before what was called the shock and awe that uh, went over the border and basically bulldozed through the, the entire country. And um, so I wasn't part of the shock and awe. Uh, our battalion went later. So the day I got into country is the day when the statue was coming down in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember distinctly uh, seeing that that was the day that we got into country. So I was pretty far behind the lines, you know, that, that sort of thing. But we had, a, we had a job to do, and one of our jobs was basically destroying any kind of uh, munitions, uh, small arms, uh, land, uh, tank mines, any kind of mines, that kind of thing, mm. that could be used to make IEDs or improvised explosive devices. So... We're on convoy. We started in Kuwait City, mm -hmm. went up to the border, you know, had to wait at the border for a while because it was like a traffic jam at the border. And then we got over into country and it took us four days to convoy from Kuwait City to the northern city of Mosul. Wow. That's, that's where we ended up. Okay. But on the way up there during the convoys, you know, we'd have to stop each night. We stopped for lunch, stop. So I, it was one of those stops. It was in the middle of the day. Uh, it was one of those stops for lunch that uh, once I got down out of the MTV, which is the truck that we were riding in, that uh, there was a, a, just a huge pile of green uniforms right there, right on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things, if you remember some of the news footage, they were saying, you know, that a lot of the fighters, the Iraqi army or whatever, as, as soon as they saw Americans, they would take off all their uniforms and just blend right back into... So instead of surrendering, that was their... That was their thing was to, you right, know, to get, get back, get back into, in, to be, uh, become civilians again. Like and then Part of society or... Well, basically right. to yeah, fight another in. fight, to yeah. live another day, to fight another fight. And those are the ones that became the insurgents. Amazing. So here was this pile of uniforms on the side of the road and I got to looking at them and there was this, the gold over there is like 22. It's like, 
it's not like our gold is. It's a very, it's it's much yellower, I guess, much higher quality. Oh, well, I don't know if it's higher quality. Carrot. It's higher carat. So it's like 22 carat gold. Content, right. Gold yeah. Content. So there's more gold content in it. Right. And I'm looking at these metals and they're made out of gold. I mean, they've got gold. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's got gold all around. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was pretty shiny. It was, I was, you know, I was like, Ooh, wow. Shiny, you know? And I went after it and I found at least 10 of wow. these metals mm. and, uh, they, they they scared us to death. They told us, no, no, you can't bring back any kind of contraband, any kind of thing that you, you know, find or, you know, no swords, no gold, no nothing like that. Right. So I was kind of scared. So I didn't keep all of the medals. I gave them out to each one of the guys. Uh, they were very happy and stuff. Oh, look at this. This is cool, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I gave out the medals and I kept one for myself. And I had no idea what it was. I just, I kept it for the gold, to tell you the truth. And uh, I had no idea what it was, but it's round. So when I went back through security to get back home, I had acquired quite a few challenge coins. Mm -hmm. And that was in with my challenge coins. And it went right through the, and I didn't get, nice. <laughs> I didn't get stopped for bringing your, contraband your, your back home. Your customs inspection. Yeah, my <laughs> customs inspection. Yeah, I wasn't, I, I wasn't bringing contraband back. But... <laughs> You know, the interesting thing is, is that I had no idea what this metal was or what it represented. And um, it wasn't until I started volunteering here at the museum that I discovered yeah. what this metal really meant. And it was basically uh, Saddam Hussein before he knew the Americans were coming. I mean, he just They just knew it. And uh, so what he did to try to inspire his troops was that he minted and made these and he called them the mother of all battles, metal, because this was going to be the big biggest one. fight. Yeah, this was <laughs> going to be the biggest fight that Iraq ever had against the Americans. So this was his way, because, you know, usually metals, they don't come until yeah. after. Much later. Yeah, they, they come after the war. Okay. And uh, so he actually gave this medal out to folks before the war to try to get them inspired enough to fight against the Americans. And here they are. And, you found them all in a big pile. And I found them all in a big pile, so it didn't work. I'm Dis sorry, Saddam, it didn't work. So, Discarded. So what else do we have in your little display case? All right, so this little display case here. Back. Now, I've got uh, I've got my brother's. I, mean, no, I say brother. I have got my brother-in-law's medals that he earned when he went to Iraq. He was in okay. the uh, 4th uh, Construction Battalion of the navy and uh, they call them cbs right and uh so he went over there as a part of a cb battalion and they basically built uh infrastructure for our soldiers uh not only for the navy but they did they built infrastructure for uh the army as well because there's this one really good story that he told me uh, about being in iraq was that uh they were building kind of like a, a barracks, uh, living quarters mm -hmm. for Army Special Forces. Wow. And uh, if anybody knows, you know, Delta Force, Army Special Forces, uh, those guys, I mean, they were there before the war started, and they are still there after the war, you know. And um, so they needed, you know, temporary li living quarters or whatever, and they, the, the Seabees, the Navy Seabees, built structures for the Army. So they can have a place to live. And what was cool about it was that the special forces guys were so appreciative of the Navy Seabees that built them their their living quarters mm -hmm. that they invited them to come and dine in their dining hall. So that means uh, my brother-in-law didn't have to go to the big major dining hall or whatever. He could actually dine in a much... I don't know if you would call it nicer or whatever, but, you know, I, he would he would get to dine. Yeah, a much more intimate, <laughs> smaller dining hall. Sure. You know, didn't have to wait in long lines and D that sort D of fact, thing. Right? Yeah. Dining facility. And a dining facility. Right. So it was, it was really cool for him because the Army showed him their appreciation for what he did for them. Mm -hmm. And he said... The SEALs never showed us any appreciation whatsoever. <laughs> Navy SEALs. That's right. They, we were just expected to build for them. So, you know, it was really, yeah. he, he really enjoyed 
the special forces guys so was this for the north army of baghdad this was up in mosul or now i was in mosul oh, okay, i have right, no right, I, right. I have no idea where my brother-in-law was where no he was idea. building this yeah right but uh anyway those are those are his medals that he earned for doing that and uh, i'll probably talk about that a little bit more uh the other thing i wanted to talk about is sure. um i've got a, a great story about my saddam hussein money so, <laughs> um, obviously, you know, once the Americans invaded, uh, Saddam Hussein dinars, they're called dinars, were basically worthless um, because he was taken, once we invaded, he was taken basically out of power. Um, but the cool thing about these dollars is how I got them. And uh, basically, when I was in Mosul, mm -hmm. There was these tribes up there called the Bedouins, the Bedouin tribes. And the Bedouins are a lot like, say, the Maasai in Africa. The Maasai are the, the guys that have the uh, uh, leopard pelts or the lion pelts and that sort of thing. And they, move they don't have, yeah, so all of the land is theirs. Okay. You know, so there, there's no boundaries, um, you know, in, in the bushlands in Africa, the Maasai they own the lands. Okay. Same thing with the uh, plains okay. in Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia. These Bedouin tribes, yeah. there's there's no borders, no no surveyors out there, you know, saying here's a map, this is what you have. <clears throat> They're allowed to graze their sheep everywhere. Interesting. Yeah. So they live in tents. And they pull the tents down and they move around and they graze their sheep and that sort of thing. Whenever so the ready. funny thing about that was, is that we had a secured area. You know, it was quarantined off. We had Constantino wire, which is the thick round bales of razor wire mm -hmm. around the whole perimeter. We had armed guards. We had Bradley tanks out there. You know, it was guarded very well. Mm. But these Bedouins, mm -hmm. they would herd their sheep and they would herd them right right right, right across our them. lines yeah right right through our, our right our, through the front lines right through the front lines and you know obviously we didn't want to hurt them because yeah you know they're they're yeah. part of the people that we we were there to liberate right and uh so we had to do something we had to come up with a deal to try to keep them out of our secured area because you know we were worried about guys dressing up as Bedouins and maybe coming in and trying yeah. to steal some of the tank rounds and or mines and stuff that we were trying IED. to destroy yeah. that we hadn't destroyed yet okay. that they could make IEDs out of. Mm. And we found out that the Bedouins were coming in and they were taking this stuff. They weren't taking the mines. They weren't taking the tank rounds or the RPGs. They were taking the wooden boxes that they came in. <laughs> That's so, all they wanted. Yes. Saddam had these things. And I've got pictures of this. Saddam had these things stacked up everywhere. Yeah. And, but they wanted the wood to either carry stuff in or burn it as firewood. Yeah. So we made a deal with the Bedouins. We're like, okay, so what we're going to do is when we destroy this stuff, we're going to take the extra step. We're going to dump it out of the box and we're going to bring the boxes out to the edge of the perimeter and we're going to let you guys have the boxes so that's take, that's the deal we made yeah that's take them from there that's that's the deal we made with the bedouins okay but i was there i was actually shooting video of this transaction going on and we had a translator there and uh one of the guys i noticed had this huge roll of these their blue greenish you know dollars Right. And, it, and his fist. I mean, just like a mob guy, you know, just rolled up in a round roll. Did he and know I, they were worthless at the time? I, or? Well, I tell you what. They, this they is the, didn't get the word yet. Well, this is how it went down. Uh -huh. So I pulled out. I had a, you know, a bunch of American dollars in my pocket. One dollar bills. And I said, I'll trade you a one dollar bill for your 250 dinar note with Saddam's picture on it. <laughs> and so that's what we did. I, I gave him, I've got two 250 dinars here, and then I've got two 50, uh, 50 dinars. Okay. So that's what I basically traded him a piece of paper for a piece of paper. 
and uh, I got me a nice little souvenir. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, I don't know how much that American dollar was worth to them. To them, I right. mean, it it could, it could have been meals. It, it could have been gone a long way. Yeah, it him. could have been a. It, uh, I don't know. He might have been able to get a whole sheep for that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> and then one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the good old gas mask. Now, as a journalist, you know, we got a little bit of training, not much, obviously not boot camp, but the one thing the Army did want us to know how to do and how to do quickly was put on a gas mask. Right. So uh, I wore this gas mask pretty much uh, almost every day while I was still in Kuwait. So we were in Kuwait a few weeks before we did the month-long trek across Iraq and that sort of thing. Right. And so okay. Saddam Hussein was, uh, when we were still in Kuwait, Saddam Hussein still had these things called Scud missiles. And basically these were missiles on the back end of trucks and they could drive around in the desert, shoot one off and then drive away. And the Americans wouldn't have any kind of target mm-hmm. to try to target back. So, but the bad thing about the Scuds is that they were terribly inaccurate and terribly slow. Right. And thank goodness we had a thing called the Patriot Missile System because they would just knock them right out of the sky before they ever made it to Kuwait City. Did you see any? I did not see Inter- intercepts. I, I did not see any intercepts, no. Okay. Because basically, you know, we'd be working whatever we're doing, and then just the air raid sirens would go off. Mm-hmm. So we were required, when the air raid sirens went off, we were required to get this mask on within three seconds. Mm-hmm. So you had to get it over your head, and then you had to put your hand over the end of, of it and suck it up to where it would seal around your face out of the bag and we had yeah out of the bag so we had to get these on i mean three seconds was the the target time sometimes it was six you know but we got very proficient at putting on these masks very quickly and i do have some pictures of me you know these pictures of of me having to wear the mask and do my job at the same time But we did, we had to wear these masks. We had to carry, that's what this carrying case here is for. We had to carry these masks Mm. with us everywhere we went. I mean, it was was like having a sidearm on or something like that, you know. We had to have it every single time. And uh, so we got practice probably about three times a day. You know, the air raid sirens would go on. And you're like, you know grabbing and trying to get the velcro up and then get this thing you you had to grab it you had to grab it by the back let's see if i can still do this so you had to grab it by the back get it over your head slide it over ah there we go you got a good seal yeah gotta have a good seal on it or it's yeah worthless right so there we go how you like that folks i can still do it all right (laughs) very nice very cool I think that's all I've got. Okay. Is that all you've got, Tom? Uh, <laughs> for this evening, yes. And yes. Uh, I, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that my nephew just retired from the Army. All right, very good. Sergeant First Class Brian K. Falks out of uh, New York City. So he lives in New Jersey now. And I, I think the next thing that I'm going to discuss will be his uniform that we have set up that he wore in Iraq when he was there in 2003 with the uh, 1st Cav Division out of Fort Hood. Oh, yeah, 1st so Cav. They, so they were part of Shock and Awe then, huh? They were. They were up in Sadr City. Oh, uh, terrible, Camp, terrible Camp, part. Camp Bastion, uh, Camp, I don't know, one of the big camps over there by the airport. And they would, he was a uh, Cav Scout. They would have to drive through the streets of Baghdad and uh, fight insurgents or whoever in in Sadr City. Mm. I honestly, I don't know who, uh, you know, were they fighting the Republican Guard or anything like that? I'm not totally sure, but uh, he did mention the fact that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers had set up a, uh, a water treatment plant and it was a really big deal for everybody in that area because now they had fresh water. Oh, and they yeah, had that's, a that's big grand opening celebration and 
there was several car bombs went off mm. simultaneously, and uh, he sent me some pictures, and wow. I, I just couldn't believe the devastation. Wow. And, it was, and you have those pictures? Yeah. Oh, wow. They're in that, my that's going to be well, great. they're in my phone. Yeah, but that's but that would be yeah, you. that'll be yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to sign off here. I think we've got enough inf uh, enough material for yeah. quite a few more videos. Okay. Please, please, if you haven't gone to our YouTube channel, you must go to YouTube, type in Veterans History Museum Carolinas in the search bar, and bam, you'll be right there at our YouTube channel. And you, there's just so many great videos right there. And our last eight videos that we did here, Night at the Museum, are also posted right there. So hit that subscribe button. Well, and was the one more thing that I wanted to mention. Oh, Tom was, keeps talking. He loves to talk. <laughs> Let me tell you. I'm sorry. The fact that uh, we're doing uh, veteran interviews and they, uh, Janice and Michael, uh, to the ladies from oh, the yeah, museum in their own, here. Yes, they're, in, they're in their own words, yeah. On, yeah, in your own words, and they're putting them on our uh, website, the museum's website, and uh, people get to submit a, uh, a short brief article or whatever on an individual. It could be themselves, or it could be a veteran themselves, or a grandpa, father, whatever, somebody from their family, and uh, some of their experiences with deal you know having to deal with their Absolutely. father or whoever and uh you know how some people were okay talking about their uh experiences in mm -hmm. the war and and some of them they said we we never knew we we never knew what what dad or grandpa did in the war and uh it, it was the same thing with my dad my dad fought in korea and i never had any kind of discussions with my dad he just wouldn't ever talk about it yeah now, I know way more now about his unit and everything in Korea than than I ever did when he was alive so wow. it's it's a shame yeah yeah uh, very I, much. I wish I you know, well that's one of our missions here more. is to definitely right. preserve and we want to preserve all the histories of you know all of our families so with that we're going to say good night good night Tom Good night, Ken. Have All a good right. Evening and thanks for the Oreos. And Absolutely. And make sure you come back and see us again.